Trevor Jackson in this evening. What's the strangest thing you've seen in the wild? I've heard some weird and wonderful stories over the years, but the reported sightings of Tasmanian tigers in far north Queensland has got to be one of the more outrageous ones. Yet, as unbelievable as it may seem, it's got Professor Bill Lawrence from James Cook University intrigued. Professor Lawrence, hello. Hi, Trevor. <laughs> Hi. What were the circumstances of these sightings? Well, a uh, bit of a long story. Uh, recently, some months ago, a professor at the University of New South Wales, Mike Archer, announced that they had plans to clone a thylacine. Uh, and that's pretty dramatic news. And a longtime local resident who's a former tourism operator and outdoorsman uh, living in Ravenshoe up in North Queensland came out, and he's become an elderly gentleman, and he claimed that, what well, called local radio station, and claimed that in 1983 he had a very detailed observation of, a, of four, ostensibly four, thylacines on a couple of times in, in one night, at one point as close as 20 feet with a spotlight. And he did this rather lengthy interview, and um, I was called, I do some things with the local radio, and, and I was called up and asked to listen to this. And I was, it was interesting. I mean, it was, you know, this guy was uh, not your average sort of, uh, you know, vague description. There, there, was, there was something more to this. So anyway, I ended up phoning him, and I just had a long, uh, open-ended interview where I was very careful not to put words in his mouth and, and just sort of let him tell me and just kind of teased out this long uh, explanation and then sort of scratched my head and sort of went through and tried to think, well, what else could this be? And, and on a combination of things from, I mean, firstly, thought seems a fairly distinctive-looking animal, but on the basis of the descriptions of a very distinctive red eye shine, the body form, of course, those famous lateral stripes, which he was very certain about, um, and then, you know, shy nature, all that stuff. So, um, you know, you could kind of cross out other uh, obvious things that someone could easily confuse or potentially confuse, like feral pigs or dingoes or dingo wild dog hybrids or foxes don't really occur up here because it's too warm, yeah. possibly swamp wallabies. I mean, there wasn't, there's a fairly limited list of things that, uh, you know, a credible observer could mix up. And this guy was sort of so specific and detailed and obviously, you know, very sober. And he, he in fact, he'd sat on this observation, he said, for a long time because, well, for all those years, because he just didn't want to be labeled a kook. Well, I was going to ask you about that, because we're talking about something 34 years ago and thinking, well, it's easy if you go, oh, yeah, way back when, you know, I actually did see something. It, mm. it, it makes it very hard to verify it. And, mm. and given, too, were you suspicious about, even though he had a lot of detail, I mean, you could easily read up on the characteristics yeah. of a thylacine and be convincing. Yes. Yes, I think, uh, I mean, in talking to them, I mean, I don't know if I'm, a, you know, especially good judge of character, but what I could tell I mean, this guy, he, my impression was he really believed it. Um, there was enough of that kind of random detail in there that, you you know, it'd be hard to kind of make that up. But um, you just, I mean, I, you know, my frank impression was that he either saw something that he really believed was a thylacine or he had somehow over the years managed to kind of self-hypnotize himself into believing that and, and had somehow incorporated detailed descriptions and i'm not you know i'm no psychologist but i could just say i mean i asked him a lot of detailed stuff and and he um at, you know at first blush passed um a fairly critical set of questions now by no means have i ever you know claimed or my colleagues have ever claimed that we think it's likely that a thylacine occurs in the region but we're in fact involved in ongoing surveys of rare and declining mammals in the region and there was another person a long-term national parks ranger that i've known for a long time who also then came out subsequently very shortly after that and gave a similarly compelling uh, observation and he was another robot bushman and was out in the boonies and saw something in in the moonlight and he, he got a, a good look at it. He claims he, he saw the stripes, his you know, body form and all that. Right. Talked to the local aboriginals, and he said, oh, yeah, you've seen the Moonlight Tiger. So very matter-of-fact about it. So anyway, so that's... Was, that, was this around the same time, around the early uh, 80s? Or? Yes, he, in his case, I think it was 1986. Right. A couple of observations, roughly in the same area, remote areas of Cape York, and we basically felt like, um, on the one hand, you know, we knew this was what's called, you know, re firmly in the realm of what's called cryptobiology, which I am... I haste to tell. I'm a mainstream scientist. You know, I do. I do real research, and the you deal with the facts. Monsters is not what we do. <laughs> yes. So, uh, but anyway, there was enough there to make it worthwhile. We felt to at least 
sharpen the focus of what we're doing, and we do have some pretty high-tech equipment, and we've got a lot of experience around the world, including in Australia, of uh, uh, a lot of these field surveys for rare wildlife. So, you know, we've we've decided to bring this in, and uh, it's been an interesting exercise in all kinds of senses. Yeah, okay. So, so do you think that it could even be remotely possible that these sightings are real? Well, I've been around long enough that, you know, you learn to you never say never. And there's been enough of these so-called Lazarus species that have been rediscovered. I mean, the mountain pygmy possum in Australia, um, the, um, the um, Selenodon, uh, the giant terror skink. I mean, there's a whole kind of zoo of species that were thought to be extinct either, you know, dozens of years ago to hundreds of years ago. And some things that have even we've rediscovered that were thought to have disappeared millions of years ago. The coelacanth, of course, the fish discovered in the Indian Ocean, was thought to have disappeared around the time that the dinosaurs went. And the famous Willemi pine, which is near Sydney, mm. I mean, that's a representative of a plant family that was thought to have died out something like 200 million years ago. So you, I think you learn after a while in biology to be a bit humble, and you know, it's almost slightly arrogant to say we know everything. Cause we, and I work in tropical rainforests primarily, and I just know we're, we're discovering new stuff, all, new species. All, right. all the time. Well, we, even though the thylacine is usually associated with Tasmania, they were, of course, also on the mainland. Yeah. The last known captive Tasmanian tiger died in a Hobart Zoo back in 1936. Mm-hmm. When were they last sighted on the mainland that we know of? Well, I mean, this is going back. They evidently disappeared simultaneously, or, or not simultaneously, but probably in response to the introduction of dingoes. Um, I've heard claims of a subfossil as recent as 1,000 years on the on the mainland, somewhere between 1,000 and probably 3,000 years ago, is when they're thought they had been traditionally thought to have disappeared on the mainland. But it's not really clear precisely why. Whether it was competition for dingoes, whether there was some persecution from humans. Some people suggested there were diseases and it might have been brought in with dingoes or other animals that could have potentially affected them. So you know, it's, it's this is like looking at a car wreck that happened. Uh, you know, one to one to three thousand years ago, and trying to infer what what really happened. Yeah. Uh, but bottom line is, um, they definitely occurred on the mainland, um, and there is uh, my understanding is there's subfossil evidence that it could be as recent as one thousand years. Okay. Now it's it's not just the thylacines that uh, you're you're investigating. There are a number of endangered species in northern Queensland that you mentioned. So what else are you seeking to uh, mm. to investigate? Well, there's been a really striking decline. We all know, of course, that Australia has lost more mammal species than any other continent. And and even before the modern extinctions, which are stretching back the last 200 years or so, Australia lost a number of its really large, the megafauna. The same thing happened all over the world when humans arrived. And it's pretty clear that it's human hunting or some combination of hunting and um, changes in fire regimes and changes in vegetation. Some, some, some people bring in climate change, but I think that the evidence is more compelling probably for some, something around hunting and, and fire regime change. But anyway, so there's a bunch of big things. There's a rhinoceros-sized wombat that disappeared and predatory kangaroos, a whole bunch of things vanished. Then you had the second wave of extinctions that occurred uh, when the Europeans arrived and, and introduced foxes and cats and, and things like that. And then we've had this recent kind of uh, not extinction wave, but we're heading in that direction. We've had catastrophic declines. And this has been, again, one of these kind of car wrecks that's been pieced together. A few places there was some good data, like Kakadu National Park. There had been some population monitoring of mammals. But some of it's been actually pieced together by one of my colleagues here at, at James Cook University, actually going out and interviewing aboriginal or indigenous populations up in the far north. So it's all across the top end. And in his particular case, he went up with stuffed animals, and he was very careful and, and interviewed a bunch of uh, local community members and asked them, well, this animal here, is, is this more common than it used to be? Is it about the same? Is oh, it yeah. Common? And published that in a good scientific journal. So there's, a, been a, there's actually an, a strong body of evidence now that a bunch of these things, ranging from bandicoots to betongs to um, uh, things like some of the native rodents to some of the native smaller uh, predatory marsupials, to, um, yeah, a whole range of things, black-footed tree rats, uh, a number of these things have just, uh, northern quolls, have suddenly, or not suddenly, have sometime within the last maybe 20 years plummeted in abundance. And they seem to have gone from places where they were quite common to now being essentially vanishingly rare. Why? Nobody's really sure. That's what you hope to find out. (laughs) Yeah, well, others are interested in it, too. I mean, there's a whole, you know, there's a, a range of ideas and hypotheses, but... Uh, one of the things is we're going to, this, this thylacine 
search is pushing us to really move into some of the most remote areas of the Cape York, where we may even need to have to use a helicopter, helicopter uh, to get in. And so it's really pushing us to get out to survey, I think, and, and we know when we do these things, we always find something interesting. Um, well, so well, if I, you find a thylacine, be sure to let us know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, uh, Trevor, if we find something, the best sign will be absolute dead silence, because what will happen is we'll have to consult with the government, and we'll all get locked down. So dead <laughs> silence will be the best indication, probably. It's starting to sound like then, the X-Files then now. Then it will probably be announced eventually what the government says. It's okay. Possibly in concert with the announcement of the thylacine World Heritage Area being set up. <laughs> Well, Professor Bill Lawrence, uh, fascinating work that you're doing. Uh, let's hope that there's uh, some success and, uh, and a few surprises. Well, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks for your time.